Good morning, everyone. It's 9.02 a.m., so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Krista Ross. I'm CEO at the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to welcome you to our conversation with Federal Official Opposition Leader Aaron O'Toole. A uh, special welcome to all of our members who are here, to members of the St. John Region Chamber of Commerce who've joined us, and I see a number of elected officials uh, on our call, so we'd like to welcome them as well. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items before I introduce uh, Mr. O'Toole. First, uh, we are going to be recording this event and we will be posting it uh, for those who were not able to attend this morning. Uh, secondly, because of the large group that's with us this morning, um, everyone will remain on mute except of course for the speakers. And I encourage you to put questions for Mr. O'Toole in the chat box for the Q&A portion, which will take place um, following his presentation. We do have some pre-submitted questions uh, that we've received as well. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. And um, so our schedule today will be that I'm going to be introducing Mr. O'Toole. He'll make his remarks. We'll have some questions and then uh, finish right around 10 o'clock. So with that, I will introduce our guest speaker, Aaron O'Toole. Aaron O'Toole grew up in a GM family in Bowmanville, Ontario, and at the age of 18, he joined the Royal Canadian Air Force and completed his studies at the Royal Military College. He continued his officer training in Chilliwack, BC, and then Winnipeg, Manitoba, and settled in Halifax, Nova Scotia. As a tactical helicopter navigator, he participated in search and rescue missions off Canada's coast and rose to the rank of captain. After 12 years of service, he retired from the military and returned to school to complete a law degree at Dalhousie University. He spent the next year working as a lawyer in the private sector, but loyal to his brothers and sisters in arms, Aaron became one of the co-founders of the True Patriot Love Foundation, a national charity that serves veterans and their families. Elected three times in his riding of Durham, Aaron recently served as shadow cabinet minister responsible for foreign affairs, and was instrumental in establishing the Special Committee on Canada-China Relations. However, his proudest accomplishment remained marrying his wife, Rebecca, and being a dad to his two children, Molly and Jack. Elected leader of the official opposition in August 2020, he states he's committed to standing up for all Canadians and building a stronger and more united country. Please join me in welcoming Aaron O'Toole. Well, good morning, and thank you very much, Krista, and I'd like to thank all the members from the Frederick Chamber for having me today. I look forward to speaking and taking your questions, and for me, it's great to be back in Fredericton, albeit virtually. Uh, as a veteran, I'm very proud of the military families in your area and the proud history of Fredericton and the Gagetown area. As Minister of Veterans Affairs, I helped dedicate the first Afghanistan LAV monument at the entrance of the base. And it was appropriate that the first of these national monuments found a home in your community where there's great support for our men and women in uniform and military families who serve our country. It's great to be here to also discuss ways that we can improve, innovate and grow the economy. I know that's a passion for the Fredericton Chamber. It's also a passion for Canada's Conservative Party, particularly under my leadership. COVID-19 has obviously created a range of struggles and hardships for our country, including people in Fredericton and across New Brunswick. Since COVID-19 began, thousands of small businesses have struggled. Some have closed their, jo their doors, jobs have been lost, revenue has decreased, and there's uncertainty on the horizon. We need all businesses, including those in Fredericton, to not just survive this period, but prepare to thrive afterwards. Despite the effectiveness of the Atlantic bubble and very strong and swift measures, in fact, some of the leading measures in the country by the Higgs government and the good fortune of Minister Dominic Carty, who we all now know had a longstanding interest in, in pandemic history and was able to act quickly, your quick moves helped, but I know that small businesses are, are still reeling from the changes that the bubble and COVID has represented. Tourism, of course, has dramatically fallen and restaurants, bars, grocery and convenience stores rely certainly on a boost from the student population. And between 10 and 12,000 students typically attend a university or college in the Fredericton area. And as many of these programs 
have been predominantly offered online, or at least in portions of it, there's been an alarming decrease in revenue for small businesses in those catchment areas. Downtown Fredericton has suffered a wave of, of closures and many of the favorite businesses in the community and the hubs around the university have shut their doors for good. I know that businesses like Owl's Nest Books and Second Spin Records are an example. These closures have caused a negative impact on the downtown, on the community, and most importantly, it's important to remember this, behind every closure, regardless of what town or city they're in, there's a family, sometimes several families, who had poured everything into that business. And a closure is almost like a loss to the family. So Fredericton, like all parts of Canada, entering the third wave of COVID-19, we are at a crossroads as a country. We have to make a decision on what path over the months and, and years ahead, Canada wants to choose. Is it a path of reimagining our economy post COVID as Mr. Trudeau would suggest that would mean Ottawa chooses what areas and what sectors of the, of the country come back? Or do we choose the steady and far more certain and inclusive path of securing a strong future for everyone? This is what we're advocating, a path that will deliver us to a Canada where those who've struggled the most through this pandemic can get back to work, regardless of what sector or what region. That's why I recently launched Canada's recovery plan, the Conservative Party's plan to secure our future coming out of COVID-19. This plan will include a comprehensive jobs plan to recover the, millions job, the million jobs lost during the pandemic within one year, and we won't stop there. Nous allons prendre des mesures immédiates dans les secteurs les plus touchés. Je veux aider ceux et celles qui ont le plus souffert, notamment les femmes et les jeunes. We will rebuild main streets across Canada, including those in Fredericton, by assisting small businesses, providing incentives to invest in, restructure or rebuild, or even start new businesses. Our second pillar of the recovery plan, we will enact the toughest accountability and transparency laws in Canadian history. Canadians need to know that their tax dollars are respected and that there's no special access for insiders or those close to the prime minister or the government. Third, this last year has deepened the mental health crisis our communities have been facing across Canada. Our conservative government will introduce a Canada mental health action plan and boost funding partnerships with the provinces for mental health care. Mental health advocates across New Brunswick have said that mental health and addiction services are making progress, but a recently announced youth facility for mental health is three, still three to four years out. That's not good enough, we need action now. As a parent, we're alarmed with the rise of youth anxiety and depression, and I know your community experienced the loss of a young person that reverberated across the country. We will also introduce a nationwide three-digit suicide prevention hotline. No one is isolated and no one should feel that they don't have a, have a route to take to get well. Our fourth pillar, we will ensure our country is never unprepared for a crisis again. Canada's Conservatives will make Canada more resilient, reduce our reliance on foreign countries like China, and take seriously our responsibility to protect the health of Canadians. That means domestic vaccine manufacturing capacity and self-sufficiency on critical items like PPE as well. Finally, our fifth pillar, the Conservative government will secure Canada's economy by getting the budget back to balance over the next decade. Pendant la pandémie, dépenser pour protéger les Canadiens était la bonne chose à faire. Les conservateurs l'ont appuyé. But we can't pass unsustainable debt to future generations. Once the recovery starts, the Conservative Party will get spending under control in a way that's equitable and fair. And we will get the economy growing again in all sectors and all regions to secure the revenue needed to pay for the government services Canadians depend on, like health care and old age security. But to achieve any of this, we first need a successful vaccine rollout so we can be begin to have a plan to reopen our economy and get life back to normal. 
less than 2% of Canadians are fully vaccinated. As a G7 country, Canada is at the bottom for vaccine rollout. As the Conservative opposition, we wanted the government to succeed on vaccines because Canadians needed them to succeed. And we wonder how a leading developed country with a long history in biosciences like Canada, how do we end up in 50th or 60th place in vaccine deployment? It is a failure of leadership by the Trudeau government in Ottawa, and Canadians can't afford such failures in the future because the very future of our economy and our well being is now what is at stake. The decisions we take in the next couple of years will define Canada for this generation and for the next. And as the father of two, my greatest worry is failing to leave a better, a stronger, a, un a more united Canada for my children. So that's what drives me. And that what is what drives my Conservative colleagues, including several on the call with us this morning. C'est pourquoi tous les jours, je partage ma vision avec les Canadiens pour un Canada plus fort, plus prospère et plus uni. As we recover from COVID-19, it's time for certainty and competent leadership. It's time for ethical leadership in politics again. I want you to know that coming out of COVID-19, a conservative government led by me will have your back. We will not pick or choose who we help recover from the pandemic. We will make sure no one is left behind in any region or any sector. A Conservative government will be ready to do whatever it takes to get the economy back on track and secure a bright future for Fredericton, for New Brunswick, and for all Canadians. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be moderating questions. As I mentioned, uh, we did receive a number in advance, but we will be taking questions from the chat. The first one I'm going to read is from uh, Mr. Alan Dillon. He says, hello, Mr. O'Toole. I'm the president of the Fredericton PC party. I'm also a veteran, founder of Cyber New Brunswick and advocate on our very strong cybersecurity industry in Fredericton. I'm interested in your perspective to the Canadian forces and national security needs in protecting Canada and Canadians and our allies digitally from the onslaught of adversarial activity of certain uh, nation state threats. Can you provide your perspectives in this regard? Well, thank you, Alan, uh, and thank you for your service. As I said, uh, there, I've always enjoyed coming to Fredericton. I, 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 I meet so many military families and veterans, very proud of their service, and many who served at Gagetown return and then retire in the region, which is fantastic. And I'm glad you mentioned cyber because I actually had on one of my lit written notes, the Center for Cybersecurity is an example of innovation. Uh, the research chair in cyber is in Fredericton. There's a hub of, of startups working with the university and with the, with the military. What a great opportunity to continue to cultivate that hub. Uh, that's how it works. Usually leading minds, a university and some small businesses. Uh, Mr. Trudeau can decide where to pick or choose so-called clusters, but the government doesn't create innovation. It sets an environment for that innovation to occur and allow the startup companies to scale up in Canada. So we're going to be developing a lot of policies to aid that, Alan. And I would be the first veteran since Lester B. Pearson to become prime minister. And I want to make sure we fix military procurement, take the politics out of it. I know it better than anyone. I flew on the Sea King helicopter as a navigator. The Sea King was canceled by Mr. Kretja and $500 million was wasted in penalties. So we need to stop the politicization of it learn from what Australia is doing. And one of the areas where I think we need enhanced uh, defense and security spending that would actually trickle into uh, private sector opportunities and research opportunities is in cyber. If you could imagine a cyber attack on our financial uh, infrastructure or our electricity grid, that would be as paralyzing as any sort of uh, traditional terror attack. Uh, it could lock up people's resources, cause a run on, on, on items and, and goods, um, and cause panic and uncertainty. And we've seen some bad actors uh, engage in this. Uh, Russia with the uh, shutting down part of an electricity grid in, in Ukraine. These are live and real risks. So this specific expenditure can actually help 
stimulate leading private sector players in cyber, including in Fredericton, while also securing our country, while also contributing to our NATO 2% target, because supporting our cyber security and infrastructure is just as important these days as uh, some of the training items we see on the training fields at CFB Gagetown. So this will be a, an area of priority, Alan, as will a respectful and informed dialogue on, on our military and veterans. That's something I've always tried to bring throughout my public life. Thank you. Certainly cyber is a, a key priority industry in uh, Fredericton and in the New Brunswick region. Um, our next question is one that I think is on everybody's mind. And we wonder if you might be able to predict or tell us when you expect there to be an election. <laughs> Um, if anyone has a great prediction, I'd like to hear it because I have to kind of get ready for one uh, as a new leader that uh, my two big speeches of my life, my victory speech and my convention speech were given to a handful of audiovisual people in an empty room. My family couldn't even be at my, my last one. So I, I hope to pierce the bubble and, and get down to see folks in Atlantic Canada soon. So I have no idea um, why there's the speculation around the elections. I really think we need vaccines before votes. Mr. Trudeau should put health and economic interest of the country first, not the narrow interests of his party. Um, that's my priority. I know many of the other parties, including the NDP in, in uh, Ottawa, have said we need to focus on the coming third wave. We need to focus on better deployment of vaccines, more consistent public health information. The Trudeau government and Minister Haiju have literally almost been misleading people with respect to dosing on the Pfizer vaccine, AstraZeneca, other things. There's so much uncertainty, it is not the time for the election. But Krista, when you have Justin Trudeau in this, in this format, please ask him because he really has the, the keys to the vehicle here. I have to make sure we're gonna be ready, but I don't think it's appropriate until we've turned the corner on COVID. Well, if we have a, a Zoom meeting with Justin Trudeau, we'll be sure to ask him <laughs> that question as well. Perfect. Um, the next question that's come in through the chat, how are you engaging with the best Atlantic Canadian representatives who are trusted and respected in this region? I think they're looking for uh, uh, people who might then run for the Conservative Party. Well, that's a, that's a great point. I can make this prediction, Chris, and I'm pretty certain in it. I've done more Zoom calls and, and telephone town halls than any Canadian, um, both from my leadership race and as leader, because I haven't been able to travel. And so I've done some, some incredible uh, uh, meetings with, with business leaders, nonprofit leaders, uh, communities where we, we take calls and I take questions and Q&A in a, in a town hall format. I do that to listen as much as I do to talk about our Canada recovery plan, because I want to know what people are thinking. And certainly uh, in Atlantic Canada, there's a lot of concerns about some of the long-term demographic challenges, both from the, the healthcare and the economic development standpoint. So part of our jobs recovery plan, we're going to have some specific policies uh, based on helping um, small businesses uh, be able to transfer ownership to, to other people to make sure that a founder, when they retire, don't liquidate the company and let 10 to 12 or 30 people go. We want to see those businesses continue, whether or not the family member can have the business transferred to them or, or to employees or to another group. So we're, we're hearing the concerns on the ground. Um, I'm, I'm arranging another call with, with Premier Higgs either today or tomorrow, I believe, to talk about um, everything from the pandemic, the, the vaccines, and of course, the recent Supreme Court decision with respect to the carbon tax. I want to bring an approach where we see Ottawa partner with the provinces, not have a top-down paternalistic uh, approach on policies. So how can we leverage work being done by the provinces, whether it's on climate change, whether it's on long-term care and support for seniors? I want Ottawa to be a partner. And so we're, we're engaging and in as many ways as we as we can um, across the country. And so I did a, a session like this yesterday in Burnaby with 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 their board of trade and with some business leaders. Today, I'm doing a virtual tour in New Brunswick. I wish I was there in person, having lived in Atlantic Canada for the better part of a decade. 
through my military service, through going to Dalhousie, my work with the True Patriot Love Foundation, we were supporting the Military Family Resource Center in Fredericton um, long before I was ever elected to office. So if you ever wanna see if I'm sincere in these initiatives, look and see what the politician did before they sought votes. I worked with the New Brunswick government uh, on things like population growth when I was a volunteer lawyer with a group called East Coast Connected out of Toronto, connecting businesses from Atlantic Canada with investors in Toronto. So any way I can help, sometimes it's leading, sometimes it's being part of a team. You talk about, um, you know, working with newcomers and investment here. One of the things that we're encouraging is for uh, more people to come to our very safe uh, province and uh, perhaps work remotely or, or establish their family and their homes here. That brings us to a question about uh, homes. House sale inventory is at an all time low. We're hearing again about thoughts of tax and capital gains on selling your home, and that will make it tougher for people to find homes. What is your position on this? Oh, we, we would fight tooth and nail um, the, the, the change to the capital gains exemption on, on your primary residence. In fact, it scared a lot of people when uh, the government uh, had a study that was looking at that. There's been such an outcry that uh, to, to, be, to be truthful, they said they're not going to do that, um, which I think is good um, because it, it is scary, you know, with the massive deficit we face, and no real plan, no budget for over two years, there is a real fear that the, the Liberals aren't gonna try and get balance again. They're just gonna try and tax Canadians more. There's, there's talk about raising uh, a range of taxes, creating new tax brackets. And then of course, this rumor of the change to a position with the house. Of course, most Canadians, their retirement savings in large part, the biggest uh, part of it is their home. And so removing that, removing the capital gains benefit from it would be uh, would be very very unfair. So we're looking at a range of housing policies. Obviously, in Burnaby yesterday, the the housing situation is a crisis. Young people, most people can't get into the homes. In some parts of the country, foreign buying and a and a range of other issues are causing pressures and a housing bubble that is scaring most economists in in terms of Vancouver and Toronto these days. So how can we set policies? that allow uh, people coming out of school to get a job, tackle their student debt, and ha still have the, the objective, the goal of home ownership. We wanna see that continue. Some areas of the country, it's a little easier, but we, we need to keep that policy and make sure people can, can develop savings for retirement through their home. Thank you for that. Um, when we talk about taxes that harm um, Canadians or small businesses, one of the ones that's been uh, very difficult for, for our tourism sector, restaurant sector, and what we consider to be a very big growing sector here in our region, the, the craft uh, brewing sector. What is your position on the alcohol escalator tax, which sees annual indefinite increases to alcohol and spirits? Um, dead set against it. <laughs> you know, in fact, it was unparliamentary to create. And an escalator tax in that way. It really, tax increases are intended to be brought to Parliament. You know, it's part of one of our democratic um, um, elements of our parliamentary democracy. And the fact that they were uh, having automatic increases on taxes without a bill or any measure coming back to Parliament is, is undemocratic in my view, or certainly breaks the tradition. So we will end that, it's unfair. Um, when I was uh, in the military in Halifax, I was an investor in an early uh, uh, microbrewery called Garrison Brewing. Um, uh, once they started making money, they, they, they got rid of small investors like me. But whenever I'm in Atlantic Canada, I love trying so many uh, of the new micros that pop up. So that is part of the tourism and the, the local food and culture. Um, it's unfair to 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 those craft breweries, but also to hospitality in general, to just see it as a, a constantly area to, to claw more tax away from. So we will undo the escalator and try to have a much more fair approach to, to those type of consumption taxes. Another question that's come in and about another very important sector. Uh, New Brunswick is the most forestry dependent province in the country. 
under the Harper government, a successful pulp and paper green transformation fund resulted in improved environmental performance and production. The current government has generously supported the early intervention strategy against spruce budworm. What would an O'Toole-led government offer the forestry sector that would improve our global competitiveness? Great question. And I've been speaking to a number of players in, in the forestry sector over my seven months as leader. And this is an area where uh, it's, it's a resource sector that can, Canada is a sustainability leader in. Our forestry practices are about the best in the world. And depending on where you are in the country, for every uh, tree harvested for fiber, you see three or four planted. You also see uh, increasing partnerships with uh, Indigenous uh, communities and Canadians. Uh, it's ESGI leadership, environmental social governance and Indigenous partnerships. I, I want to see more of that. We, we need to provide certainty with the sector. And I think there's more we can do on sustainability by making sure the forestry sector is part of a net zero by 2050 made in Canada plan where we can actually maximize some of the good work on carbon sequestration being done in forestry and agriculture and other sectors, while at the same time also reducing emissions in, in highly emitting sectors like energy and others. I think there's a win-win a, a here working with the sector. So we would continue those practices. We also need a, a soft wood lumber agreement. It is more of an acute issue in other parts of the country because there are a lot of private wood lots, of course, in Atlantic Canada, but this has also been something that has held back uh, our sector. In the last 40 to 50 years, there's only been two of these uh, strong and, and secure negotiations uh, agreements struck with the Americans by the Mulroney government and by the Harper government. So this will be a, a priority for, for us is restoring that preferred and, and special access to the US economy. It is really atrophied terribly under Mr. Trudeau. Another question uh, related to uh, natural resource. Um, this is from the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Their question is, as prime minister, would you push for the construction of the Energy East pipeline? And if so, what would be your strategy to complete the project? Thanks, and I've had some great sessions with, uh, with CME and even worked with Dennis Darby when I was at uh, Procter & Gamble years ago, where I worked on paper, uh, Bounty and Sherman <laughs> of all things. Um, we, we have to have a plan that really focuses on, on um, addressing our competitiveness um, for the economy. And I think um, what, we, what we've seen with Mr. Trudeau has been an ideological approach. The Bill C-69 was a bill that I think nine out of 10 premiers asked him not to pass. That led to the cancellation of the Energy East pipeline. In fact, the company said that it was going to make the return on the investment so uncertain, the process for approval so uncertain that they could not proceed. Unlike Mr. Trudeau, I don't think the government should be buying pipelines and shouldn't be picking and choosing which, which projects win and which lose. What we wanna do is to set a fair and predictable regulatory landscape so that these investments can be made so that environmental mitigation can be a priority, but there can be certainty. So we're gonna un, unwind Bill C-69 and, and really show that we can have a regulatory process that is predictable and fair. It is then up to industry to, to make decisions with respect to um, the best access to get resources to market. Um, so that is how I think we need to, to, to show industry that projects can get, get done in Canada with the appropriate and predictable time for regulatory review. Uh, the one thing I will say is we are very proud of, of the refining capability in St. John. It, it is important to the, to the GDP of the province and, and an example of, of, uh, of an upgrading of resources potential that we have in Canada. So I, we do see that as an asset and we want to try and assist that, uh, maintaining that asset for both New Brunswick and for the country. Another question, this has come in from the Atlantica Centre for Energy. Does the Conservative Party of Canada have a current position with respect to the introduction of the clean fuel standard? We're, we're looking at the clean fuel standard regulations um, as part of 
a wider set of policies that we're looking at with respect to the environment. It, it is clear that Canadians want us to address climate change. I want us to address climate change and have a serious plan to reduce emissions over a predictable time frame, while also making sure our economy is competitive. So right now we're in the process of I wouldn't say finalizing, but getting close to finalizing our environmental platform and our climate change measures in particular. I don't support Mr. Trudeau's uh, carbon tax. In fact, he broke another promise. He at first said he would leave carbon pricing to the provinces. He broke that promise. He then said he would never raise the carbon tax. He's now tripling it. That will have an adverse effect on some of the most vulnerable people and on small businesses that don't recruit costs make us less competitive. So we're trying to come up with a solution that addresses both larger industrial emissions, but also addresses emissions across the country in a way that we think the provinces can partner with. Uh, what we do on fuel, what we do on terms of aligning with the, with the US with respect to, to fuel, with respect to vehicles, and a whole range of things so that we're not uncompetitive, this is all going into what will be a comprehensive platform that we hope to launch in the, in the next couple of months. Another question uh, in the same vein, can you explain how a carbon price charged instead on large emitters would be more effective at reducing emissions and would not end up being passed on to consumers? Well, the one example I often use is there are about 600 emitters in Canada, industrial uh, facilities that account for about 35% of our emissions as a country, roughly. So a better, a smarter approach is to have a regulatory approach that's, that gets those emissions down. We, we know where they are and the, the industries, the businesses are in the process of trying to get their emissions down as well. So we can, can we work on getting those emissions down on a time frame that's that's predictable and fair. Um, the hope is without increasing costs, and the real hope is without reducing production. You know, Mr. Trudeau and some members of his cabinet have talked about closing down the oil sands, for example, or just shutting down industry in order to make emissions targets. That will make us less prosperous. That will lead to more long-term unemployment. That will lead to more national unity challenges. So the goal of emission reduction is not to close the, the facilities. It's to incentivize through tax and through working with them on a, on a, on a predictable timeline to get emissions down. Um, so that's an approach for, for larger emitters that I think would not cause the cost pressures that an overall carbon tax that's tripling does on the economy. But we do need also to look at transportation and other sectors that have a large number of emissions. That's why the Conservatives will be uh, unveiling a substantive policy that we feel both the provinces and the private sector will see is positive in terms of getting emissions down without making the poorest pay or making us uncompetitive. Tell us how you or what your thoughts are on SMRs. This is uh, an industry that's um, being supported and um, looking for opportunity. And, you know, as Chambers of Commerce, we're looking at supply chain opportunities. Where are you at on SMRs? I'm probably the earliest proponent of small modular reactors. In fact, when I got to Ottawa about uh, eight years ago, I started a nuclear caucus in, in Ottawa. One didn't exist to drive awareness. I have the Darlington generating station in my riding, which produces uh, greenhouse gas emission, free electricity for, for Ontario. I've met with the team at Point La Pro, for example. There's, there's the ability for Canada to take its world-class heritage here and in innovation and adapt it for this new setting, the small modular reactor that allows a, a much smaller and contained generating source for remote mine sites, remote communities, including we have a very scattered population in the, in the north that relies exclusively on diesel and stores two or three years worth of diesel to generate electricity. Are there ways we can use this innovation and then manufacture these almost like, um, almost like a modern assembly line in, in Canada and help the world with their emissions? So this is a sector 
nuclear has about 70 to 80,000 highly skilled, highly paid employees across Canada and the provinces that have, that have used, used it to generate electricity, including New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, have had great success. Uh, the age means that Quebec is turning the page. Some innovation is allowing New Brunswick and Ontario to continue, but SMRs hold exciting opportunity for both climate change, emission reduction, maintaining our leadership in terms of this type of technology and huge export opportunities for, for both manufacturers and supply companies in Canada. Going to switch gears a little bit now. Um, I have a question from the uh, CEO of the New Brunswick Medical Society, Anthony Knight. He asks, what is your vision for investing in healthcare as a government in a way that addresses the challenges associated with our aging population and the needs of our most vulnerable? Well, thank you. Um, this is something I have worked on for a number of years. I said as a lawyer in Toronto, I was involved in, in a group called East Coast Connected, and we worked with the provinces on investment uh, with the business community in Toronto. A lot of transplant expat Maritimers, Atlantic Canadians that wanted to, to, to maintain that connection. And when I worked with the government at the time with the Population Growth Secretariat, that's when I first got to see firsthand some of the demographic challenges with a declining population in some parts of Atlantic Canada, including New Brunswick, and rising elderly demographic with challenging health outcomes uh, and, a, and a shrinking tax base. That is a recipe for a two-tier healthcare system. And how can we, as a federal government, partner to make sure that that's not the case? Clearly, the provinces are in the driver's seat when it comes to jurisdiction for healthcare, but we do have to recognize some of these unique demographic challenges and within the, the, the health transfer process to make sure that we don't have um, massive disparities in, in access across the country. And we're committed to do that. I've, I've spoken to, uh, to a, a number of leaders on this over, over several years. And in two leaderships, I've raised this as an issue because it is important to me. Of course, I, I lived in Atlantic Canada, met my wife in Nova Scotia and was very involved in the election of Premier Ham at the time. And, so I wanna make sure that, uh, that Atlantic Canada has a voice. It has not had a voice in the last six years when the ACOA minister, for example, has never been from Atlantic Canada, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. That's a sign that there's been, uh, the Atlantic, Atlantic Canada has been taken for granted by the Trudeau government. It will not be from me. I'm, I'm an honorary Atlantic Canadian and this specific demographic challenges in terms of access to a family doctor in terms of standards, in terms of uh, critical and rare disease medicines is something that we will try and be a partner on. I'm going to uh, turn another corner and uh, bring up tourism. Tourism has been one of the hardest hit sectors uh, from coast to coast to coast. And uh, without the federal government programs that were put in place, there would be a lot more tourism operators that would be shutting down permanently. How would a conservative government continue to support these hardest hit sectors, businesses in the tourism sector into 2022? Well, thanks, Krista. That, that is an important question. It actually highlights that the conservatives have been pushing uh, on these issues for, for many months. In fact, we used one of the few days we have to bring an entire debate to the House of Commons um, to, to raise the plight of tourism operators, our airlines, and some of the highly uh, impacted sectors in this pandemic. We need predictable support programs now that actually help through a transition. We need a plan, uh, a data-driven, safe plan for reopening. Once certain metrics of, of vaccination, suppression of the variants, and, and the use of rapid tests can be done, businesses need certainty. And that's been the biggest complaint with, with the federal government. Look, we've supported many of the federal governments, well, all of the programs to help Canadians and help small businesses. We would approve the program and then fight to improve them. We fought to improve the wage subsidy, the rent assistance, the SEBA loan program. Um, businesses in these highly uh, affected sectors need certainty beyond the, the opening up because tourism and, and some others will be suppressed. 
So we brought that debate, pushing the government to provide that now. This is why when I say we're, as part of the recovery plan, we're going to have a plan back to balance over the next decade. It's because I know in the first couple of years, we will have to have specific supports, incentivize, as I said, save Main Street, but also help save some of these impacted sectors like tourism so that they can thrive later. I worked on restructurings in, in the private sector as a lawyer, and I saw when you save the business, you save the jobs, you save the pensions in some cases, you just save the supply chains. And when the economy recovers, that business can then thrive and even hire more people. So that's why we need to have an all hands on deck approach to, to make sure we have as few business failures as possible. Uh, that's in our Canada recovery plan we've launched now. We've been fighting for it in Parliament for many months. I've been fighting for the regional routes that are impacting uh, Atlantic Canada. I'm speaking with the New Brunswick airport authorities later today because I know how, how, how hard they've had it and they've been trying to adapt their operations to survive. So this will be the, the serious approach we have to these things to provide certainty for some of these impacted sectors. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to the uh, Fredericton uh, Airport. Um, just yesterday, they announced that their major renovation was completed uh, on time or early and under budget. So when flights resume in June to the Fredericton Airport, um, we hope that uh, you'll be able to uh, come and visit this region in person. Um, I, I want to ask uh, a question about, uh, I guess, getting people here. Um, immigration is so important to our economy. Newcomer entrepreneurs bring so much to us, uh, as well as international students. But there's a big backlog at IRCC, and that's been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. How can we address this? Important question. Thank you. We have to address the backlog, uh, particularly so many family reunification cases, they're, they're tragic, have been caught in the, the pandemic backlog. There was already a slight backlog before that. We knew there was going to be uh, delays, but whenever there's families separated, how can we accelerate those uh, as much as possible? That, that will be a priority for us. And the longer term, you've recognized something that I think we have to change the way we do things. Um, Canada should not use the same public policy for 30, 40 years just because we've done it that way. Um, immigration is, is a key one. The provincial nominee program and, and some of our approach to immigration, we need to target Atlantic Canada better. Where we have declining population as a G7 country and we're welcoming more and more immigrants and we should, let's work as hard as we can to make sure that we are addressing the demographic challenges um, that, that we see some provinces facing. And we can adapt programs uh, to, to encourage and sense and even require that both on, on immigration and a refugee resettlement approach for students in terms of, of study and visa and in terms of, of uh, businesses. Um, I, I'm open to looking at a return to the to the economic class if we can make sure that we save some businesses through through an infusion of of uh, investment from someone who who may get accelerated from coming here we've got to use immigration better for our skills gap for for population growth and for for opportunity so that's that's going to be something i'm i'm committed to i think this is a time to make sure that we address some of the long-standing challenges. We should, we should really have programs that allow people to settle and really establish roots in part of Atlantic Canada, as opposed to almost every, every newcomer coming to two or three large urban centers uh, with already challenges on a, on a housing affordability and a whole range of others, uh, other areas. Let's get this right. Immigration is important, but we have to have smarter, more effective approach to it. And I think the lifestyle opportunities in Atlantic Canada are unparalleled. So we really need to, to leverage this better. So if we're in agreement that um, the economy and the success of our economy is tied to increasing our population through immigration, 
How will we deal with the major issue of rental properties not being enough to house this increase? Um, the cost of building is increasing. It's, it's, some might say it's out of control. How will your government help the development of new rental properties and affordable rental housing? This is an area that uh, is a priority for us as well. I've, I've appointed the first shadow minister for housing that, uh, that our party has had to specifically try and, and craft policy to address this. This is an area, as you know, Krista, where municipal order of government, province and federal have to be involved as, as much as the private sector and, and even in some cases, nonprofits. Um, we have to have more supply. We have to have access for first time home buyers and we need affordable housing. So all of that means there, there needs to be private sector investment and certainty with respect to, to a, a fair but predictable return for some of these, these investments because that's the only way we're gonna see a rapid increase in, in availability. We're, we're, in, we're gonna have as part of our election platform a range of policies that will not just take into effect some of the acute challenges in, in the lower mainland of BC and Toronto, but will really try and increase uh, the, the supply and, and address the affordability issue in all parts of the country. Um, each, each part of the country have their unique issues and that's why we have to take a partnership approach. Going to switch uh, to another topic, agriculture and aquaculture, farming, fishing, and food processing, they're all critical to our nation's food security. How would your government help ensure food producers are supported in the recovery to maintain supply chains and to create jobs? Food security is, is critical. You're absolutely right. And we, we truly value what our farming families are able to to produce and aquaculture is a, is a huge and, and, and growing industry in Atlantic Canada in particular and, and holds great promise as well. There's a few things we can do. We can make sure that some of our, of our um, farm support programs are, are bankable and, and easier to access for families in terms of the risk management programs. I've heard that in almost all of my, my outreach meetings with ag community and, and farming families from coast to coast. So that's one thing. We have to open new markets for our producers, particularly grains and oil seeds uh, and beef and pork. We are going to see more uncertainty and likely challenges with consistent exports to China over the next decade, not because of Canada, <laughs> because of the bad conduct of the Communist uh, Party of China on human rights with the Uyghurs on Hong Kong, their disruption of trade when it comes to steel, aluminum, other products. So we have to work with our allies to, to counterbalance these trade issues. And because of that uncertainty, we need to restore better links with India, which have, have fallen under Mr. Trudeau. The Indo-Pacific, Indonesia, Vietnam, the more, the more markets we have, the more consistent price we have for our farming families. We also have to have a more serious approach to negotiations. On the NAFTA deal, Mr. Trudeau had bad outcomes on, on supply management, bad outcomes on steel, aluminum, auto. Uh, we need to fight for our interests. And that means when the US spend more on agricultural subsidies than we do on our military, they cannot lecture us with respect to the supply managed process. And this is where I think I will have a better approach with respect to the United States. I served in our armed forces and often trained and served alongside the Americans, worked for a large American company in Canada, Procter & Gamble. When I went down to meet my counterpart as Veterans Affairs Minister, we knew one another from our private sector experience beforehand. So this is, we have to have a much more serious approach in the United States to talk trade, security, and, and working together with respect to China. Just as, a, as an aside, you mentioned um, India, and I'm not sure if you're aware that the New Brunswick government has announced establishing um, an office in India to support uh, trade and export with, with India. Um, keeping with the agriculture, aquaculture, farming, fishing, food processing, one of the challenges that we hear from our members is that it's difficult for them to find employees um, to work in these industries. 
So relating to that, do you think that the EI system needs reform? And if so, how? Um, I think it's less, to be honest with you, Krista, the EI system and more uh, training dollars. We, we, the federal government spends billions on training, but it's not often strategic. We, and this is something I found, I was, I was elected late in the, in the last conservative government. I was parliamentary secretary for trade. And then I was the last cabinet minister, Prime Minister Harper uh, appointed. And I saw the critical labor shortages uh, when the economy was booming in, in Western Canada. And the fact that Canada, we track every occupation in Canada. They're all given a code. We know where there are shortages. And too, too often we were just band-aiding those shortages with temporary foreign workers when we weren't using that data to actually inform our retraining dollars. We weren't using that data to partner with industry and with, with the provinces on skills training, on, on community college, polytechnics, universities. We know where the shortages are. And maybe this is the, the business background I have. Use that to improve. Um, only government would just keep doing things with temporary foreign workers and patching over some of the productivity challenges. So there are actually shortages for food processing, uh, not just in Atlantic Canada, New Brunswick, Quebec, it's a huge issue, Southern Ontario, huge issue, and at times, um, Brandon, Manitoba issue. So this is where I think the federal government partnering with the provinces, I want to make sure we use the data to drive solutions, not just do things the way they were done for 30 years. And this will be a huge difference between Mr. Trudeau and myself. I read the decisions, I read the contracts, I get into the details and I demand the best. I'm a good person to work with, I think, but I demand excellence. And that's how I turned around the Veterans Affairs Department. I built a strong and professional team. We established a plan and we executed. That's what we need in some of these areas. So I think it's less about EI and more about making sure we get far more effective use of those, of those training dollars and that we actually look at chronic areas of shortages and provincial and federal partnerships and private sector partnerships to, to fill it. And I, I certainly over the years have, have, have talked about these things with McCain's to, to, to everyone else in between. And I think uh, this is a commitment that we will make to, to make sure that productivity is high by addressing these gaps in the workforce. Uh, related to um, training, I guess, uh, education, we have a great question from Science East. What are your views on science education and developing an innovation economy? This is something that is exciting, and I'm glad, you know, Alan, the first question off the top, we talked about the cyber hub that's, uh, that, that we find in Fredericton and the real opportunity for that. Um, innovation often builds in hubs around uh, universities, but also with respect to one or two key innovators. There's usually a little ecosystem that can, that can build up around them. Where the federal government's role is, is not placing magic super clusters in places. And, you know, that was 10 years after the entire cluster concept had started. It was a backwards old style way of thinking. We actually have to set the the landscape to incentivize some risk taking, to incentivize dollars from the sidelines into the, the startup ecosystem. And particularly when it comes to science and R&D, how can shred dollars, federal uh, research dollars be easier to access and not sort of a, a consultancy business? Um, how, how can we make sure that we also use the tax system to incentivize private dollars into some of these companies. Because the real challenge, and I meet with the Canadian Council of Innovators and Jim Balzilli and a whole range of people to get their perspective. Our big challenge is we've got incredible talent and brains, but we usually have a startup and they, in their second or third round of financing beyond the sort of angel investor stage, they start looking to the US because they can't access the capital here. And the risk is we lose them to the US, either they move or they just sell. If we can grow a few up more up to scale, um, um, that's what we wanna see, that more of the Shopify's, 
uh, more of the of the uh, open text and 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 companies like that. So we're going to be looking at a combination of improving some of the existing programs and using the tax system to incentivize growth and some of the world-class science being done at our at our university and colleges um, that is core to these to these hubs of innovation i like the idea of incentivizing growth that that sounds like a positive idea we've only got a couple of minutes left i'm going to ask you one last uh question uh and then i'm going to turn things over to our president bob chisholm um so my last question to you is what do you think and, and we'll ask you to keep it uh, brief so we keep on time. What are the three most important issues in the upcoming or the next election? Well, thank you, Krista. The, I have a five point plan for the Canada recovery and I encourage people to look at it, but I'll, I'll take the top three out of those for me. It's one jobs uh, in all sectors, in all regions of the country. I really worry about language from Ottawa that we're going to build back better or we're reimagining the economy, that means they're going to exclude people from their story. Whereas we need the rising tide to lift all boats coming out of COVID-19. So that jobs focus, million jobs in one year, that's going to be our relentless pursuit. The other thing is mental health and wellness. I, I can't stress it enough. It's something I've worked on since I left the military and my largely my work with True Patriot Love was in this area. As a new MP, I partnered with Romeo Dallaire on mental health initiative because I found the more you get people the help they need quickly, the more they can avoid a spiral from a mental health condition. That spiral can involve addiction, family breakdown, uh, and, and even suicide in some cases. So uh, mental wellness is core to our wellness. So we're going to have a national mental health action plan. And I don't know a single family that hasn't been touched. So mental health will be the third, uh, the second thing. And, and the, the third piece, we have to learn the lessons from this pandemic. We are a G7 country. We are a country that 100 years ago this year gave insulin to the world and generations of diabetics. Now we have to rely on other countries for our vaccines. That's unacceptable in my view. We will have a plan to make sure that we secure that capacity at home and that we're more self-reliant. So those would be my top three. And I, I hope people want to see a government that can deliver and do so in the interests of all Canadians, not a select few, which it always seems to be with the Trudeau government. Well, I appreciate that answer. And we certainly appreciate your time today and your interest in our region. I'm going to ask our president, Bob Chisholm, uh, to turn on his mic and his camera, and he's going to uh, thank you for your presentation this morning. Thanks, Krista. And uh, Aaron, it's a real pleasure to have you as the official leader of Canada's opposition party talking to our chamber. Um, you know, coming out of this pandemic more than ever, open and honest communication between political leaders and business leaders is gonna be critical. Uh, we wanna turn the country around and get it going as, as badly as, as you do. Um, we have a lot of great ideas and we have a lot of great members in our, our thousands strong. So us being able to understand your position, your party's position on the key issues has been very helpful today. And, and we appreciate that. Um, I also wanna shout out to our chamber staff, which, which Krista leads the work they did to prepare this. I wanna thank all who attended. These events are really important and our chamber is continuing to hold a number of virtual events. I hope there aren't too many more in the future. I hope we can get into some in-person events. Um, but, I, but I think right now communication and understanding things virtually is, is absolutely critical. And uh, this has been a good tool and again, Appreciate your sacrifices. Uh, appreciate what your family's probably been sacrificing uh, the last little while and in the future. Um, but again, thank you very much and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Krista. Be well, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.